Um, thanks for having me here today. Um, I'm Emily Chasen. I'm the sustainable finance editor at Bloomberg, um, which a lot of people don't know Bloomberg has a sustainable finance editor or a sustainable finance function. Um, it's actually a relatively new job. I just joined about three years ago. Um, I used to be at the Wall Street Journal and at Reuters, and I was actually an accounting reporter for 10 years. Um, I also wrote the Stocks Are Up Today, Stocks Are Down Today column and covered hedge funds, pension funds, bankruptcy, but lots of stuff. But um, I got interested in covering sustainable finance through accounting and sort of the sustainability reporting structure. And then I also covered corporate governance as an accounting reporter, and I saw all these battles between investors and um, companies and CFOs that I was covering at the time at the Wall Street Journal, um, talking more and more about sustainability. So I went to Bloomberg and I helped launch the sustainable finance brief and became a sustainable finance editor there. Um, why Bloomberg was launching this new product a few years ago is that we have a huge number of clients and investor clients, people who use Bloomberg terminals um, using environmental social governance data. Um, and it's been increasing pretty rapidly over the years. Um, so this is what we write about. Um, I run the weekly sustainable finance brief, which is free. <coughs> Does anybody in the audience get it? Some people get it. it. It's free, so if you don't get it and you want it, give me your business card before you go. Um, and we write about news for the terminal, and we write about climate issues on the At Climate Change website. Um, figured I'd show you a few of the headlines we've had recently on sustainability news. Uh, Wells Fargo pushed by nuns to report on its ethical lapses. Um, Starbucks and Google assailed by investors on gender policies. Apple says 100% of its supply chain now audited for conflict minerals. Um, the year of Maria and Harvey prods bond graders to rethink climate risk. And um, one of my favorites that I've worked on was investors press Facebook, Google to act on face fake news way back in 2017 in February. <laughs> so, um, these are some of the other charts and stuff. We really focus on making sure when we're talking about sustainability, we're talking about data. Um, so we talk about, we collect a lot of data on green bonds, on sustainability bonds, on um, what fund managers are doing, how um, companies are purchasing clean energy, and how investors are incorporating environmental social governance risks into their investment policies and ideas and products. Um, this is what ESG looks like on the Bloomberg terminal. If you look at the data that Bloomberg actually has, what's kind of cool about it is you can compare how a company is doing against itself on greenhouse gas emissions or um, female employees in management, and you can compare against them over time, and also like just with a click of a button, compare um, against their peers. So you can sort of see how that um, is really useful, and a lot of people do use it. There are fund managers who told me they use it, and they look at this information, and it's kind of imperfect. There's a lot of empty spots sometimes. Um, you can see I put Unilever in Facebook, that Unilever reports more sustainability data than Facebook in those topics, so um, it's not perfect. <laughs> Um, this is the same, this is another way to look at sustainability data on the Bloomberg terminal. Um, and what I try and do is actually use this data and talk to people in the market, talk to academics, talk to investors, talk to companies about what they're doing and sort of try to connect the dots and stories. Um, because this is really the issue that investors still lack the data they need to integrate sustainability into investment <coughs> information. That companies will say they're really confident in the ESG data they're reporting and the sustainability info they're reporting, and only 29% of investors think that they are confident in that information. Um, so that's something to think about. And these are a couple stories I did using Bloomberg data. Um, this one was really fun. It was really popular on the terminal. How financial services firms rate on family leave, and I think on the terminal headline it was like the best paid leave in finance, and you could literally take this comparable data um, because Bloomberg collected it on what the maternity and paternity leave policy were, just like rate the banks on it and see who's the most generous. Um, this is another one we did using Bloomberg term data. Um, utilities seek to fix their record on safety, and we took the safety reported data that Bloomberg collects out of their filings. And um, some utilities had like really great safety ratings, and some had not so great safety ratings. And we called the utilities and found out why some were better than others. And um, yeah, that's about, that's kind of what I do. That's great. Thank you okay. very much. <laughs> I think it's good. Kurt, how about? Thank you. And is this on? It is. OK, great. Um, I'm, I'm a radio guy, so I'm used to having a microphone in front of my voice, and I've never had to project, so this is helpful. 
Um, so I'm Kurt Nikish. First of all, thanks very much for having me here. Um, I think this simple <clears throat> network is a great idea. We all have so much to offer each other, and um, anytime you can sort of lower the barriers for something like that, um, it goes a long way. So I'm glad to be here, and um, I also think that education is maybe the best way to change the world, so you're in a good business. Um, so just to give you a little bit of background about me, I was a German literature major in college. Um, I hated business at the time, um, <coughs> maybe for good reasons, but um, I wasn't really, I was interested in sustainability, I didn't care about business, I thought it was stupid. And um, I, I uh, ended up getting into journalism. I was a radio reporter in South Dakota where I started to learn about, oh, money is actually kind of important. And um, it's a good organizing principle for stories. People pay attention when it's about money. And, um, and I cover lots of things like poorest county in the nation, but also lots of agriculture uh, stories. And that's where I cover lots of things like ethanol, um, carbon sequestration, when everybody was excited about that out there. And um, yeah, and ended up just doing more and more of that, worked for Marketplace, and um, just found that um, radio is a little different, right, because you are trying to do, at that time, when the only way you could reach people was through radio towers, you had to do something that was interesting for everybody. So the biggest compliment you could get when you worked for Marketplace was, um, oh, I don't even like business, but that, I love that show. That story was really interesting. So you do learn to kind of tell um, uh, difficult stories or so-called important stories in, in interesting ways that people um, connect to. And, um, and then I went to Boston where I covered business and technology for 10 years, including cellulosic ethanol companies and technology startups and lots of stuff in the uh, wind wind power battles and, and sort of lots of stuff in that space. So that's my background. I've been at Harvard Business Review for two years where I'm finally speaking to an only business audience or management audience. And um, But now, because of podcasting, you don't have to do that through the radio tower and you can really do specific stuff for those audiences. So I definitely um, come from more of a, <clears throat> yeah, more of a, consumer-facing type of storytelling, and um, and that's, I think, one little thing, I'll, one, one perspective I'll bring to this panel. At Harvard Business Review, we've had a few things. Um, we find that sustainability is something we think is important, and we have people writing for us about it. Um, the articles often don't perform very well, um, so you have this classic sort of news economics uh, incentive battle between sort of what's short-term um, value and what we know is also important to people around the world and our audience and the people that we're trying to reach, which is that people really care about sustainability and it's why Paul Pullman's doing this stuff at, at Unilever. So um, it's definitely something that uh, we're working on. We did pilot a <coughs> podcast last year um, about what businesses are doing to respond to climate change. So that's a possibility that's still in development. Um, but we certainly grapple with some of the same questions that you do too. And I think um, one thing I can offer today, and maybe I'll just end with this, is that whenever I hear sustainability stories, it sounds like a lot of kale to me <laughs> and not enough smoothie. Um, so, um, <laughs> yeah, I, um, I think ways to, you know, put a little bit of kale in the smoothie, um, can be helpful. And, um, and I also don't hear enough people. Um, I think people care about people. A lot of people don't care about saving the planet because it's not going in anywhere, but they do care about, you know, people and businesses are important because of what they do for people and because of the legacy that they leave for people and the people who did it. So um, that's another just quick observation I'll make to get started. Brian? Um, well, thank you very much for, to Maya for inviting me to this conference. Uh, it's a very important topic, very important issue. Um, and thanks to everybody for coming from so far away to, to be here. Um, so I wanted to start by hitting the question direct on, or head on. Um, well, do people care? Does anybody care? I think from Emily's um, conversation, she it's clear that investors care, um, but I think that 
broader public care as well. Uh, I think the polling data really kind of shows this. Um, general views on, on these issues, majorities in both parties support um, increased use of sustainable technologies, uh, solar and wind, government support of those even. Um, a May Pew, uh, May Pew poll showed about 60% believe that climate change affects their local local areas, and half of those think it affects them personally. Um, and large majorities um, say government should be doing more, or government's doing not, not enough to protect um, the clean, uh, clean air and water, um, protect uh, pursue public lands, curb climate change, that kind of thing. Um, and I think when we look at the markets that are really hot right now, the, uh, what people are willing to spend money on, um, Whole Foods is doing really well. I mean, Amazon, you know, of course, there's a reason Amazon bought it. Um, people are willing to spend more money to be sustainable, whether it's because it's cool or because it's because they care about the earth. You know, it's a mixed bag, but there's a lot of interest in that. And I, I can share a personal anecdote. I'm from North Dakota, which is a very conservative state. Sustainability is not usually on the agenda, or recycling for that matter, or climate change. Um, I went to school in Minneapolis, at the University of Minnesota, um, where I started to get, you know, this is many years ago, but I started to get engaged on eating organic, sustainable issues, climate change, um, recycling for the first time. Um, that's kind of when there was kind of a revolution in terms of that becoming more cost effective. Meanwhile, my, my older sister, who is very conservative, she lived nearby and she was disdainful of all this, of recycling, of living sustainably. It sounded like tree hugger nonsense. And, um, and of course, climate change is a non-starter starter for her. So, so, but fast forward to today, I mean, she boasts to me of recycling, of things she's doing in her daily life that is more sustainable, um, uh, different things. She still, of course, doesn't really buy climate change, but, but there are ways to engage her on these topics. And, and um, uh, there are articles that she's interested in reading that you know, help her live a more sustainable life. Or she cares about companies that support, that are doing different things to, to be more sustainable, um, that kind of thing. So, kind of the bottom line, bottom line for me is, you know, if we look beyond partisan nature of some of these issues, I mean, there's a prism through which liberals and conservatives sort of see these issues in many ways, we hear climate change, another buzzword, that kind of turns them off. But there's great demand for, for, for this, the, learning about the research that everybody in this room is doing, um, and how it relates to their lives, how, it, how can help them understand this complicated marketplace of products, you know, what's sustainable, what's not, what's, um, you know, free range, cage free, what's the difference, what's actually good for the environment, um, you know, is there a, a sustainable smartphone out there, um, these kinds of questions, how to make their footprint smaller and also, um, especially among millennials, um, you know, what companies are doing, they want to support companies, full show, they want to support companies that care about these issues, that's doing more for the environment. Um, so, I mean, to me, it's not about whether people care. I mean, people do care. Investors care. Um, editors and journalists care about this issue and trying to find ways to bring stories into the public domain. It's just, it's a question of communication um, and finding a better way to, you know, trying to find, find a way to, to connect this re the research that's going on in your centers around the world to the way people live, um, making them understand these issues. It's not about um, knowledge, like as Katrina was saying. I mean, it's not about just sharing knowledge with them, imparting knowledge like they're in school. <coughs> it's, about, it's about really engaging with storytelling, with, with a strong narrative um, that, that connects these things to their lives um, and, and, and shows that it matters um, and becomes a part of the cultural thing. Uh, like my sister, I think, is a good example of, I mean, very conservative, very skeptical of everything we're probably discussing in this room, you know, at least the way we discuss it perhaps, but is very interested in, in the underlying, in the, in the results, in what it really means for her life and, you know, raising four kids and, and that kind of thing. And in a place like Bismarck, North Dakota. Um, so, so as, Maya asked me to leave with a, uh, be a little bit of a flamethrower. And so I, I guess a good rule of thumb in my book would be that if you can't explain explain why your research matters, or why what you're doing, what you want to turn into an article matters, then perhaps it doesn't. Or at least, you know, you have to reframe what you're thinking about. Like, why, that's, I mean, it's a good place to start with anything. Why does this matter to, to people, you know? Um, if you can do that, I think you can, you can find a way to tell a good story and connect it.
And, so, and just to follow up, we've heard, and the articles that we run, we run a lot of sustainable articles. We've done series on climate change, things like that, all written by academics. Um, for those who don't know about the conversation, our sole mission is to, to use academic authors, expert authors um, throughout the world and help them write articles based on the research, but also just connecting to the news. You know, um, you know what happened yesterday, today, uh, at the border, immigration, what does it mean? Um, and we run a lot of these stories and they, it depends on how well, it, a lot of them get, you know, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 reads, which isn't nothing. Um, but sometimes when they're, when they're done right, when the topic is interesting, when they're really engaging, you know, they can get tens of thousands or twenties of thousands. So, so it really depends. Yeah, that, that start with why really resonates with me. Uh, I'm part uh, of an area that has uh, a lot of sustainability passion folks and an embedded oil and gas business culture. And when, when we think about it, uh, we at Simon Sinek's start with why. I don't know if you're familiar with that model, but it starts with why, and then there's a how, and then there's a what. And those conversations on one side with that incumbent oil and gas tend to be a how and a what conversation, but no why that resonates with people. And on the other side, I found that the sustainability proposition of leaving the world better for future generations than, than we found it resonates passionately, but from a business school perspective, we don't have a clear path to how and what that resonates and is economically viable. So I'm wondering if, if you could comment on how you looked at the why, or if you were to give us some advice on why, from your perspective, because it seems you've given snippets through your flamethrower, uh, and, and if that how and what matters as well when you're looking at these things. Um, well, an interesting example that's on a different topic um, that I think, in terms of what trying to get past, so the immigration debate, you just did a, I just ran a story today on um, what's happening on the southern border, and her research is focused, I asked her, to, the, the author, to focus on why we should care about the undocumented undocumented immigrants that are living in the U.S. right now, the 11 million or so. Um, like, what are they doing? What are they doing? What, what's the role they're playing in the economy and that kind of thing? And so, like, but beyond that, I mean, when you're looking at these children being separated from their parents and, you know, the lives that people are living, the dreamers, the children of these immigrants, um, you know, it's why should you have to go any further than huma their humanity? Like, why, like, isn't it obvious we should care about them? But of course, she goes on to explain that, you know, they're vital, they play better roles in agriculture, in construction. So many industries would be imperiled if suddenly they were deported, as Trump was um, proposing to do some years ago. Um, so the same thing on sustainability. It's obvious to a lot of these people, to everybody in the room, I'm sure, but why we should care and why it matters and why it's so interesting. But to a lot of people who, like my sister who has four children, she's got her busy life and everything, you know, everybody's working, everybody's, you know, inundated with news and information. Um, you have to go a little bit further and sometimes say something like, why is it, why is it, why, why should they care? Why, and go ahead. Yeah, I wanted to pick up on sort of that theme, but one of the things that we've sort of been focused on is, um, George Serafine from Harvard, he's a really popular sustainability researcher, but he had some research a few years ago about materiality and when sustainable was material was it was more connected to your business. Um, so if you were a business that was focusing on stuff that was not material to your business, not connected to like the main, your main purpose for being, it didn't really have an impact on your business. But if you had a business that was like, you know, an agriculture business, and you're really focused on sustainable practices in your meat production, you know, that is impactful to your business. And so we're always trying to get the conversation in sustainability out of marketing and into like how it matters to the business. Like, so I used to be an accounting reporter for literally 10 years. So that's what I really want to see is a story where it shows that this is something that's material to your business, or this is something we've accomplished that will be material. Um, to a business. A good example of it is I did a story a few weeks ago with the um, CEO of Danone, the yogurt company, um, that they are converting, they just became the largest US B Corp, um, and they're trying to convert lots of their units into B Corp, and he has this goal of turning basically the whole company into a B Corp. And he even took out a 
loan, like his latest bank loan from the bank, um, it ties sustainability goals to and his like B Corp certification process to the rate he gets on that loan from the banks. Um, because he thinks customers like really want to know that their food is sustainable. And um, that's the most important thing for his business. So that makes sense in that way. But I don't hear that many stories like that. I hear a lot of the same story over and over again, because I have like literally every company and every investor tell, and they're all just sort of in different phases of their sustainability journey. Um, so a lot of times when people first start, I hear exactly the same thing I've heard from like 20 other banks um, in that. But um, it's, a, it's a learning process through it. And sometimes people do choose to do really amazing things. And um, sometimes they just don't quite know how to sell. They, they're not even sure what they're, where they're starting yet or what they're doing. So there's, there's a lot of room for improvement. Um, so, first of all, I didn't know that that's how you pronounce the company name, so that's how I'm learning, <laughs> learning as I go. Um, um, I would say that, yeah, I, I think that's a familiar problem, like, if you talk about a paper company that plants trees and harvests them, like, sustainability is a really obvious, like, part of the business, and that's easy for people to understand, and there are other companies where it's, where it's harder, so you have to kind of... Um, figure out what that what that simple narrative is and climate change it seems so hard but it's also a, it's everybody understands a budget and it's just an energy budget and so if you can find um, simple models it helps people to understand that better um, the last thing I'd say is um, to get back to people like um, on the undocumented immigrants question I think even now after all the coverage we've had and certainly like in the recent weeks, you can you can get a better sense and have more empathy for for um, whose lives are being affected. But probably, I still don't just as a citizen have like a good sense of what it's like to be one. But what it's like to wake up in the morning? What do you think about? Um, what's it like getting in your car and driving somewhere? Like I still just after all the stories about immigration, I still don't really know what it's like to be an undocumented immigrant. And I think if people would, could learn to care about one person, it'd be a lot easier to care for 11 million. So that's that's just a, a thought. Rob? Thank you. Uh, to what extent is your view of you should I worry about the ending Brian sister? I missed the question. Well, I'm ending Brian sister. Well, I mean, Brian, I hope it's alright. Uh -huh. Yes, to her. Um, please. You, 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 you did introduce her in a way as, 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 as the kind of constituency that in, in the States is a big constituency, uh, surprisingly big constituency in my mind. Uh, to what extent should I worry about ending that audience? Did everybody hear that? Great. Do you want to start? Um, <laughs> I, yeah, I no, can take it. 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 <laughs> um, you know, I am not sure. Could you I mean, the question. Yeah. Oh, what? To what extent should he worry when he's doing research about um, offending people like Brian's sister? But I just figure those people aren't going to read my article on sustainability anyway. <laughs> so, um, no, but I, I think you know, Bloomberg. There's a lot of Bloomberg Forever has written sort of like these short-term, up to the minute stories. You know, and these are stories that I think are sort of designed for more long-term thinkers and long-term investors. Um, and there are quite a few long-term investors. And so if people at the pension funds tell me they've read my story, you know, I'm, I'm pleased. So that's really the audience that I'm looking for, um, if that makes sense. I guess I would ask you back, who's your we? Is your we the media, or is your we the folks in this room who are educating I mean, I'll give you an example. Where it's hard to find for me because I wrote an editorial uh, in an American magazine a few days ago, and and basically used well, basically referred to something that the U.S. government did that I thought was very offensive and you know, stupid. And the other editor said, "Who don't write this in our editorial? It's going to be." You know, you're bringing a divisive connected to the previous issue. You're bringing some divisive into this editorial space. And I'm like, well, that's how I see it. I mean, what are you going to do? Hold that hold back just because I'm going to offend the, you know, that constituency? And I, I, find, I find that a little bit you know, limiting and constraining. And I, I think it depends on your purpose. Like, what do you want to do? And there is room for activists and a room for conciliators uh, in any debate or in any, you know, all these controversial issues that issues that we 
deal with. Um, if your purpose is just to you know, let some steam off, um, like after the election, a lot of people who normally would not let up any steam, you know, were suddenly inundating us with editorials, you know, in the strongest possible terms, saying, you know, the, the alarm they feel about what's going on, that kind of thing. Um, so if you, if you feel free to do that, and there are a lot of forms for that, but what's most helpful for readers, if you want to connect with readers, like I think one thing we do pretty well at the conversation is finding a way, because our audience is very broad. We think of our audience as everybody, pretty much on the planet, because anybody could pick up our stuff. Our model is we publish things on, we work with the academic to, to craft an article that's engaging and interesting, but based on expertise, or engaging as a, um, an article you read in the newspaper of any kind by a reporter, um, but you know, backed with evidence and expertise scholarship. Um, and we, our model is basically trying to republish it in the Huffington Post, Newsweek, Time, the Daily Caller, is that what it's called? Mm -hmm. um, anybody, anybody can pick up these stories for free. Um, so we think of our audience as just everybody. We want to engage everybody. And if you come off, if the author comes off by, you know, very political or, you know, insensitive to a, or you know, offensive to a certain type of person um, who doesn't already presume or believe the things that you believe, that person's not going to read it, right? And you're not going to change their mind or you know, not push the needle a little bit. And so if you want to push the needle, which is, I think, all you can do with, with people who are so strongly opposed ideologically, I mean, you have to find a way to like take a step back and say, like, what, where can I create that common ground and just present the evidence? And if we get back to an evidence-based society, I think we would all, all these issues would have a better chance of being, lead to, lead to solutions and, or at least better, better dialogue about it. Can I bring it? Julia? Yeah, I, I, I would pose it to that we are asking the wrong question when we ask, does anyone care? I think the problem is people care too much. So we all know climate change is relevant, but we don't know how to solve it. We all know, take me too, Statistics have been out there. 20% of women get raped. 30% of children get abused at some point of time. We know that um, all these sustainability issues that they are present. The problem is it makes us emotionally upset. So what we do, we distance ourselves because they are not easy solutions. And often the answers we get from the experts is, well, we are experimenting, and we discussed this this morning, we are experimenting right now, we try to find the best solutions. You want to buy X, well, you can buy these X or that X, just to take one simple example that was mentioned. And it might be what somebody advises me today, in six months somebody will tell me, ah, no, that's really bad for this and this reason. So I'm really confused about what can I do, what is my little thing I can add? to make it right. And the reality is nobody of us knows because we are still in the learning phase. But telling that story is extremely difficult because it's so upsetting. And that's why people may not cite the articles, may not want to engage. And we somehow have to, to work with this gap of being, you know, telling people about the problem without totally overwhelming them with the fact that the perfect solution is just, you know, we try to work on it, we are not having it. And, and how we can keep people on board still trusting that this trial and error phase we are in actually will have a positive outcome. At the end. I think that's the challenge in communication. People care, but they care so much that they can't live with the answer. We really don't know what's right. Or whatever I say today, tomorrow will be wrong. Any comment? Just that that raises interesting questions for business leadership, right? How do you design a way to get people um, from where they are to where they want to be? Um, yeah, and how can you manage those? Those. Um, how do you manage those people and what they're thinking about along the, the steps of that path too? Like that's. You can't, you can't do it all in one fell swoop. Yeah, I'd say that people are definitely still learning to speak the same language. But one thing that's been sort of interesting this year is um, a lot of the oil companies are really focused on their um, methane emissions that people have, environmentalists and, you know, maybe teaming up with investors and others have convinced them that they are losing their product by allowing, you know, excess methane emissions into the atmosphere. And that's just the stuff that, like, accidentally gets released. And so they say, oh, yeah, we're going to, 
cap that off because that's like our money that we're losing and they so they think of it that way and it has a side effect um, but there are a lot of stories where the language is really confusing and going back to the egg example one of the most popular stories I've done since I've been the sustainable finance editor at Bloomberg was the story on um, cage-free eggs and all those supermarket chains that are adopting 100% cage-free egg targets and one thing we found out in the story is that supermarkets can actually um, earn a much higher profit on cage-free eggs. They charge like, they cost like three times as much as non-cage-free eggs. And so on one hand, it's like really awesome that they're all going to these cage-free egg models. On the other, that's a source of cheap sustainable, of cheap protein for, for humans um, that won't be as available to some people as it was. Um, so there's lots of questions you can bounce about that and it's like it's easy to see all these retailers like within a few months just glom onto this okay we're all going to go 100 percent cage-free egg sure you can charge three times as much for a cage-free egg but um it's a, it's a really nice price fixing you know, yeah <laughs> so but what what does it mean and like so we have to you have to think about multiple um fronts and make sure you're all speaking the same language maybe the ftc can crack down on that <laughs> do you want them to yeah. i mean i think i, I think that you're Julie, you said that you know like maybe does anyone care is the wrong question. Like maybe people care too much. I think it's also about what else do they care about, right? What do they care about more um, than sustainability? And I think you know the, the whole sort of question. I feel like Emily, your your stance here has been well. We're we're Bloomberg. Our job is to show kind of the business case for sustainability, right? George Serif's research and everything else. But I think there's other things going on in our political <coughs> culture right now, which is that people care about. There's like a libertarian ideology that is a, the, sort of a strong current that's advanced in part by you know Koch and friends. Right? There is a there is a sort of plight of the white working class thing that people are caring about, and it's when uh, when people aren't caring about sustainability, it's because there's a set of other concerns that are top of mind. And I just wonder, like, where are you seeing? From media perspective, like where are you seeing progress? Not because I, because I think we've talked about two things. One is like <clears throat> you care about people and the environment, or you care about the bottom line, and so maybe we can try and get between those two things. And I feel like that's what a lot of people. There's another set of cares that, are, that that I think are represented by the sort of populist and you know the, whatever the Trumpist mood is. That I'm just not sure if we're addressing. I'm just wondering where you're seeing. I don't know, the ability to really be multi-value and multi focal in this. Like beyond just what's good for the business. <laughs> it's a what, you what's stumped our panel. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I would expect silence in response to this question because it's a huge blind spot. Right? Like none of us knew none of us could possibly have anticipated that Trump would have been elected. No, actually I had a um interview not that long ago where the headline of the story was um, it's the CEO of Calvert in research and investment, um, John Storer, and he said, the headline was, inequality is a bigger problem than climate change. That climate change is sort of a slow moving problem, but you're almost never going to be able to fix climate change if you don't deal with inequality issues that are like affecting governments around the world. So um, that's one way to think about it. Um, I just did a panel with the UN Global Compact on the UN Sustainable Development Goals, and I was asking, you know, which one do you try and pick to choose? And he's like, well, really, they all have to go together at the same time. <laughs> and that's even more confusing. But um, yeah, there's a lot of different competing things. And sometimes one thing from one part will enable the other, or they'll disenable it. And um, that's definitely a tricky area. Really interesting discussion happening. I, I was just wondering if uh, other people were talking about your communication uh, and stories. Uh, what is happening in the developing world? Uh, for instance, uh, when you talk about the sustainable development goals, data would show that if India can take care of the sustainable development goals to a great extent, then much of the world's problem can be solved. And a lot, lot is happening there, and a lot of social entrepreneurship ventures are <coughs> coming up. My uh, question is uh, to what extent you know you are looking at those stories coming from the developing world? Because, uh, uh, please uh, correct me if I'm wrong. There is too much of focus on stories coming from the developed world, right? And there are many stories that are developing from the developing world. But I don't know if I'm, uh, for instance, if I, uh, I, me or my colleagues would uh, like to come up with stories, how do we reach out to you so that we can also reach out to a wider audience? So uh, it's not known to me. 
So this is a simple question. It's very important to sh share those stories with the world, but how do we go about doing I would say come to our workshop tomorrow <laughs> um, where we talk about um, this, but just talk to me afterwards. Um, we certainly as a audience would, I mean, even for our audio segments, which I work predominantly on, half of our audience is outside the United States, which is very rare for podcasts, actually. So, um, yeah, we definitely are a global publication and don't do enough globally, we know, um, and are always looking for more. So, yeah. So, yeah, the, same for us. Yes, um, yeah, I actually just moved my role, or we moved my role at Bloomberg. Um, I was on the investment and wealth team that covers finance, and I moved to the global business team to actually work with all the reporters that cover business around the world um, about how they're covering sustainability. So, um, it's a brand new endeavor, so I'm still meeting all the people I'm going to work with, but um, and I still run the sustainable finance newsletter and everything. But um, we're trying to think about that issue as well, and I feel like in the developing world, there's a lot of great innovation happening there, um, stories to share, and there is sort of that natural debate about, um, you know, like these economies still have to develop, and you know, some things that the U.S. can do versus there's a lot of political tension in that, right? And even in the Paris Agreement, what the happen for the developing economies versus developed economies and what concessions they made. So, um, yeah, I think if you tie it to that broader tension, that might be really um, salient. Yeah, the conversation we um, we, have a, we, uh, we have an editor in, in, actually in New York right now. Our conversation in the U.S. is based in Boston, but it's in New York. Um, she, she focuses mostly on Latin American authors, and she's doing a lot more with them, giving them the conversation and politics, society, and, and other topics. And we also have a South Africa um, bureau uh, or team, um, and they obviously deal with a lot of um, issues on the continent, a lot of that kind of um, report or research uh, editing. Um, and I publish. We all work with still with people from all over the country, all over the world, um, to try to bring a lot of these stories out. But I just wanted to say one real quick in response to Jason's thought or this Asian's question. Um, I think one thing that's important is just framing the debate. Right. If you frame the debate as regulation versus saving the planet, for a lot of people, regulation or less, you know, want the desire for less regulation will win. Right. If it's taking away their SUVs, they're not going to go for it. But if you write an article about it, you have a, you have a chance to reframe the debate and reframe what it's about, and you know, going into like why it matters and trying to get to the, through the back door, you know, of these political conversations. Um, and the other thing I was thinking about is just. Um, Sustainability stories don't have to be about sustainability. I mean, that doesn't have like it's a for editors maybe it's like oh people won't read this story so why bother with it? But if it's but it can be it can it can be about sustainability without being sustainability, right? So that's the squeegee and kale. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Stuart, I'm going to give you the last. Well, I was actually going to ask, like, what are your three strategies for blending more kale into the smoothies for academics? <laughs> How do you think about a few? And then also on the kind of long-term perspective, uh, you know, Larry Fink's letter came out this past year, kind of reverberated around. I've been struck by the Bloomberg coverage of real estate and Florida and like really long-term reporting. I'm wondering, if, is that catching more traction and attention? Because it seems to be shared around a lot in the networks that I'm in. So, how do you get more kale in the smoothie, and how do you report on the kind of longer term? To our starter? Um, yeah, so I'll talk about the reporting on the longer term perspective. Um, it's really challenging because I, I have another friend who's a climate change reporter, and he's like, "Oh, we report on a slow moving crisis, right? Like in news, they want the crisis that's like right now." Um, so you know, news is very. You, you turn on your local news station, you know how news is like. This just happened, so um, that does get a little challenging. There are wider arcs that you can loop into, you know, like we can loop into the, if there's an immigration sustainability story. Um, if there's, you know, this really shows the data, you can rely on the data and say this is the long-term cost of it. Um, I've done a story recently on like coastal um, wetlands and how they protect from hurricanes, you know, like hurricane season is actually a good time when people really actually do focus on this stuff. Um, so that story I did on the year of Harvey and Maria prompting credit graders to rethink risk, that was um, like right after the end of hurricane season and it landed in, in business week. Um, 
So there's, there's a lot, it's, I'm still trying to figure it out, honestly. So we can figure it out all together. Yeah, I think um, that's a battle we're always thinking about. How do you how do you try to take something that's important and make it as interesting as it should be? And um, <coughs> as far as <coughs> pardon me, as far as um, uh, preparing that smoothie and just getting enough kale in there, I think um, I mean for me it comes story. People are interested in people, <coughs> and um, if you can find that way into your stories. <clears throat> so, um, like, who is doing something? Like, that's an interesting thing, is when people actually do something, um, and how do they do it? Like, people are, we love to watch people work. So, um, if somebody actually does something, or young people in an organization change something, there's just a natural narrative that people, I think, would be interested in. Um, I did a story once about like a you know electricity demand response company, and um, the CEO of the company had a picture in his office of him hugging a tree, and I put that detail in the story. And the number of people who told me afterwards that they really liked that story um, was amazing, <laughs> and it wasn't that I did such a good job of explaining the spot market for electricity. So. <laughs> um, yeah, I do think that um, if you can try to find, like, what are, how, do, how would you tell this to regular people? What gets your kids interested in it? Um, if you can find personal stories with people doing things and changing things, um, that's often a good thing. At least for somebody who works in audio and in a, is in a, a more emotional human connection space, that's just... I think a natural way in that's universal for people, regardless of what country you're in. Yeah. You get the last word. Yeah, starting with people, um, like Kurt said, is a really good way to go. And I'm going to steal your idea about life in the day of a, uh, a day in the life of an immigrant, um, a legal immigrant, which would be really I think, interesting. And finding an academic to do that, um, I think, would would do really well. And it would be entirely based on that person's research. You know, I've, the person who wrote the story for Mun for that published today. She focuses on guest worker or, or, or dealing or working with farms and farm labor, undocumented labor um, throughout the New York region. Um, and so she's talking to these people all the time. And right now, with the crackdown, um, the border control basically covers the entire state of New York. So no matter where they are, they can be they can be deported if they are found. Um, and so it's incredibly stressful life. Um, and they're just they have families. They're feeding them. They're trying to do their best. And the farms need them. Um, and so I mean, that's, that's an example of a very, very, you know, Kaylee or a non Kaylee way to tell a story. And it's about their research. Um, but usually I, I, I start with academics who bring the kale, right? Sometimes they're all smoothie op-eds, um, which is a problem as well. But most of the time they just have kale. And I have to find a way to get them to like, rewrite the top. Think, think of the story differently. What really is at stake here? Try to bring it into to um, you know, a better narrative, a better a way of engaging you know, average readers and things like that. And it's, it's mostly just asking these questions that we've all been talking about, um, trying to synthesize, you know, what, crystallize what's really, this, what's really, what's really, what is this really about, and why does it matter to you know, the average reader on the street. So I want to take a minute to thank the three of you for joining us today. That was a really interesting conversation. Thank you.